Kuan Yin is the Bodhisattva of compassion. Uh, and a Bodhisattva is something uh, like a lesser deity or an angel, if you will, like that. And so I'll tell one of the many stories of Kuan Yin, but this is considered to be one of uh, the primary stories, the origin stories of Avilokiteshvara, actually. So one of the main stories of Kuan Yin. So Kuan Yin, the name Kuan Yin is a Mandarin name. She originally shows up in China. Actually, interestingly enough, Kuan Yin was originally a male, uh, but uh, around second, early second century AD, uh, uh, she becomes a female. So very quickly after the male Kuan Yin, uh, maybe less than 100 years later, uh, Kuan Yin starts to take on the female form, probably due to the Taoist influence in Buddhism, <coughs> because Taoism has that emphasis on the female-male uh, balance. And so uh, because Buddhism was coming up in China with the Taoist practices, we see uh, the emergence of Kuan Yin as a female in that culture, which is quite wonderful. There's actually another great story with Kuan Yin, the one that I'm not going to tell, uh, but I'll, I'll just tell a brief uh, synopsis of the end. Uh, Kuan Yin, is, her job is to go around the world and the universe uh, alleviating suffering. And so she does that in this one occasion, but she is now a woman and one of her students shows up and says, Kuan Yin, why are you now a woman? And Kuan Yin says, well, why does it matter? <laughs> Which is really great for second century AD China. And, and, uh, and then uh, she says, I will show up in whichever gender best serves the present moment. Beautiful. So, and that's her job, and I'm gonna get more into that later. But uh, to go back to where I digressed from, <laughs> Kuan Yin's name as a Mandarin name. It means to hear the sounds of the universe. But in Buddhist uh, thought, we recognize that it, her name means uh, to hear the cries of the universe, like that. So a very, uh, very um, empathetic, em very um, emphasizing compassion. That's the word, emphasizing compassion. So this story takes place between Kuan Yin and her teacher, uh, the Buddha Amitabha. So it's a mythological tale, really, between two mythological characters. Now, as all uh, Mahayana Buddhist students do and all later Buddhist schools, all of the students will have to do, uh, Kuan Yin was asked to take a bodhisattva vow. Uh, that's a tradition in the Mahayana school of Buddhism to take this vow. And the vow is the same in all of the Mahayana schools, uh, but it always has a personal touch to it. The vow generally reads something like, I vow to return lifetime after lifetime to alleviate suffering. That's generally the, what the vow looks like. And then there's always a personal flair to it. Now Kuan Yin's personal vow was, uh, I vow to return lifetime after lifetime to help alleviate suffering and never to fall into despair. That was her touch, was never to fall into despair, like that. And there's Kuan Yin, a beautiful statue there that I took. Uh, this was in uh, Georgetown in uh, Malaysia. Uh, Kuan Yin is often depicted with one hand up like that. That's the hand symbolizing wisdom. And one hand either pouring a vase or, or a hand down like that. The hand down is the hand of compassion. So she symbolizes the marriage of wisdom and compassion. And in many schools of Buddhism, that marriage is equivalent to enlightenment, the, the marriage or the blend of wisdom and compassion, like that. In this uh, depiction and many others, uh, she's pouring a vase. That vase is meant to be carrying an elixir, which can wash away the suffering of all beings, like that. So beautiful iconography. So, when you go to a monastery or a temple, particularly there's one here, a beautiful Kuan Yin temple, uh, there's many depictions of Kuan Yin holding a vase, holding her hands like that. Now you'll know what it means. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to, to show this slide. Uh, I know it's not photo time with Chris, but a, <laughs> a brief digression, uh, because I've never seen the male and female forms of Kuan Yin together. And so this was at a temple in Vietnam. It's the only time I've been to many, many temples around the world, never see them together. 
so I wanted to show that picture. There they are together, uh, Kuan Yin, male and female, uh, holding the same pose there. Uh, beautiful uh, iconography there. So, okay, back to the story. Back to our, our scheduled program there. <laughs> so Kuan Yin, she's working on the human realm, alleviating suffering all across the globe. Uh, the suffering of the present moment being different from what humans want, as we just discussed. And she's working with that type of suffering for eons and eons, and she never falls into despair. Arguably, that's pretty admirable. <laughs> all right. I think we can all agree to that. <laughs> then, she fall, then she rather goes to the hell realm, and she starts working with the devils and the demons and the tormented souls in the hell realm. Uh, working to alleviate their suffering. You can kind of imagine what that might have been like, right? And then maybe she gets, you know, tired of that, whatever, and she goes to heaven and starts working with the gods and the angels in the heavenly realm, alleviating the suffering of the gods and the angels. Now, I often get the question, what kind of suffering do gods experience, right? That seems kind of weird. And apparently, well, due to cos uh, Buddhist cosmology, uh, the gods experience uh, the fear of change. <clears throat> they're so cushy and in their godlike life that they always have this undercurrent or underlying fear that it can all be taken away from them. And so gods, or the gods in the Buddhist thought, uh, suffer from this fear of change like that. So Kuan Yin is there working with the gods and the angels on their fear of change. And she happens to glance down at earth. And she sees that there's more division, more anger, more conflict, more racism, more hatred than when she left. And she throws her arms up and she says, oh, what's the point? And as soon as she exclaims, what's the point, her head explodes into 10,000 pieces. And with the, her head exploding with the inertia of that blast, she's cast out of heaven and sent down to earth, falling down to earth. And she lands on the ground, thump, unconscious, lying there on the ground of earth. Now eventually, she regains consciousness and she opens whatever she has left of an eye and she sees her teacher standing at her feet, the Buddha Amitabha. And the Buddha looks down at Kuan Yin and says, oh, What happened? Everything was going so well. What, 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 what's going on? And Kuan Yin says, I, I don't know. I, I, I must have blown it. I, I think I fell into despair. And the Buddha says, Yeah, yeah I, I guess you broke your vow. Maybe what, what can we do? How can we repair this together, teacher and student? And Kuan Yin says, well, I would really want to return to my work, alleviating suffering all across the plains. Uh, it was so rewarding. And the Buddha says, fair enough. Let's, let's see how we can repair this. So together, uh, in a really, a, it's a really kind of a touching part of the story that they, they act, they work together, student and teacher, uh, repairing the damage and molding the arms back are molding the pieces of her head, rather, into arms. And that's why you see the thousand-armed Buddha, the ten-thousand-armed Buddhas. It's, it's Avilokiteshvara, the incarnation of Kuan Yin. Uh, now, uh, Avilokiteshvara, she um, retakes her vow and says, I vow again to return lifetime after lifetime, never to fall into despair. Uh, the ten-thousand arms, each one has an eye in the palm of the hand, representing a different way of seeing the truth. Again, pointing at that teaching, nobody has a monopoly on the truth, right? So 10,000 ways of seeing the truth represented in all of the arms. Uh, the other arms are carrying swords, spears, different forms of weaponry. Those weapons are said to be able to cut away human delusion and our habituated patterns. So we can live a life free from our patterned uh, um, suffering, like that. So uh, that's one way uh, that uh, uh, Avilokiteshvara alleviates 
our suffering, like that, it's said. Uh, some of the other statues you'll see Avalokiteshvara carrying a book, so a uh, teaching, a book of wisdom, like that. So another way that we alleviate our suffering is through our wisdom. Now, Avalokiteshvara has 12 heads, traditionally, and I'm going to try to get them all right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity are the bottom four heads, the Brahma Viharas. <clears throat> but above that are, is the ability to see uh, north, east, south, and west, so all, f all of the directions, that's eight heads. Then the ability to see in the past, the present, and the future, that's 11 heads. Above that is the Buddha, of, is her teacher, the Buddha Amitabha. Uh, and this statue, actually this icon has 13 heads, as if you needed another one. <laughs> and the top one there in this depiction is the historical Buddha, the Buddha Shakyamuni. And we know that because of the large earlobes and the domed head and everything like that, uh, the snail helmet uh, icon, that's the historical Buddha looking down on everything, making sure nobody falls back into despair like that. So that's the legend of Avalokiteshvara. And the real, there are many, many, many nuggets of wisdom in that story. And it's, it actually is a, a, quite a bit more detailed than I went into tonight. Um, but I just gave kind of a brief skim over the whole legend. Um, but for me, the real takeaway of that story is the not falling into despair part. And it's so easy to do, right? We turn on the news and it's just this grim, 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 after grim, after grim, you know? Uh, and so it's easy to, to, to fall into that. So we counter that um, with the practice, pardon me, with the practices of compassion, with the practices of generosity and uh, gratitude we counteract the uh, tendency to fall into despair. So the practices of gratitude and generosity and compassion balance out our tendencies to fall into despair. The reason why that's quite important is because we, when we come to a situation where there's suffering, yet we're in despair at the same time, our energy is going into that despair and not serving the present moment. So when we can really come to the present moment fully, uh, we're m much more effective in uh, resolving that situation and not fighting back our despair at the same time like that. Uh, so that's, for me, the real takeaway of the legend of Kuan Yin and Avila Teshwara.